everybody welcome back to another week at beyond the trailer park so of course as usual joining us from the wilds of Pennsylvania, and and she's awake this week uh, is beth sorry i couldn't help it <laughs> hey i mean how many people do you know go to bed at freaking 5 30 and don't wake up until 11 30. <sighs> i've done that before but that's so annoying. after an all-nighter just saying <laughs> Oh wow! It was a Monday. I should have should have expected it. It's all right. We we managed. We, it was all good. We we had uh, um, Tucker and um, Bridget came and uh, bailed me out, so it was all good. <laughs> Thank you guys. Tucker and Fuzznuts, of course. <laughs> Fuzznuts is a cat, by the way. Little Her. shits running around here somewhere. I shall I'll eventually claw me. When, whenever you find them, it's all good. And join us from the equally wild, but for other reasons, uh, Mississippi. Good evening, Morgan. Hey. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad you're feeling better this week. Yes, I am. I was just like, bleh, last week, it, it was awful. It's probably because I went canvassing in the middle of noon on a Saturday in Oxford. You, yeah. Yeah. So. Canvassing for what? Um, voting rights. So I'm getting people registered to vote and then um, asking them about issue, like their opinions on different voting things for a nonpartisan group called Mississippi Votes. And uh -huh. then um, if they're not registered, I could register them to vote. And then uh -huh. I ask them a very general question of what they think the biggest problem in Mississippi is right now. And I think the weirdest answer that has ever been given was, um, well, two of them. One of them was the government. I wasn't the one who asked this guy though. He said he just said straight up the government and would not expound on that point. And then um the other one was well, I don't think Mississippi has any problems. <laughs> wow. Oh boy. Yes. So yep, that's what I'm doing. Um, are you sure you want all these people to vote? <laughs> Well, for the most part, I get people that are, uh, you know, they're concerned about the Trump administration, things like that. So, right, um, they're just like, do I have to say one, and they have to sit there and think about it? <laughs> like, I could write a book. And you know, the one who said the government, I would have been like, so which government is that exactly you're referring? To? Yeah, I know that's what we're trying to get at. But a lot of people are not happy with, you know, the governor and how things are being ran down here. So. Um, what is it? Is it not conservative enough for them? <laughs> no, no, care. it's actually the opposite. So Oxford's like a, a more progressive area than the rest of Mississippi because it is a college town. So a lot of them are professors, um, people like that. So that's good. That's good. At more least educated than your average. That's where the sane people live, right? <laughs> Yeah, somewhat. There's still some cra There's still plenty of crazies running around, but there's like a few spots of hope. <laughs> um, Little glimmers. <laughs> it's like yeah, and, and I'm about to leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! So uh, joining us tonight, and I have no idea from where, but that's okay. You can tell us if you want to. Is uh, Gleb Sipersky? Sipersky. Oh, I had it right before the show. Damn it. <laughs> You got it right the last time, yeah. I did, but anyway, yes. welcome to the show. Sure, and I am from Columbus, Ohio, so. Columbus, teach, Ohio. Uh, yep, I teach at Ohio State University, so that's where I'm based. Gotcha, well, that's not too far. I'm in, in case you didn't know, I'm in Ontario, Canada, so mm -hmm. I'm not too terribly far from you. I've, oh, yeah. I've driven through Columbus on the way somewhere else once or twice, but. Oh, next time, next time you go through Columbus, stop at Jenny's Ice Cream. It's a nationally okay. known ice cream store, very famous, really good ice cream. Okay, I have to say, the last time I drove through Ohio, and we drove through all of it, 
um, it's got to be one of the most boring states I've ever been through. Fair enough. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe it was just because we were on our way to Louisville, and it just seemed like it was never going to end. You know, you doze off when, when someone else is driving. You doze off for a while, and you wake up. What? We're still in Ohio? Damn it. <laughs> and uh, the the way same way. Yeah, the, the one thing I always remember, though, is um, Big Butter Jesus, who became um, fried Big Butter Jesus and now is $5 foot long Jesus. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, it's down near Cincinnati, and it's this church that put a huge um industrial foam statue of jesus out in front of their church and the original one he was going like this uh, up to the sky and his other nickname was touchdown jesus uh, um, okay but, but okay. the locals tended to call him big butter jesus because he the foam was sort of butter colored hmm. he got <laughs> famously hit by lightning and burnt down to the frame and um, at which point all there was was this metal frame that looked like two big arms and he became Terminator Jesus. <laughs> That's good. I like that. And Thank I, you for I, that story. And then uh, when we when I drove through because he the the lightning strike happened in 2010 because I, I was actually in Mexico at the time and I remember reading it on my news feed going, damn, that's ironic. And I um uh, uh, some people were like, "What d does that mean that God just committed suicide because he lightning himself?" <laughs> um, and and it was 2013 when I drove through and realized that he'd been replaced, and he's now a full. The other one, it was only Jesus from like the shoulders up, which was really weird because it looked like he was like bursting out of the ground. And going, <laughs> it was the weirdest fucking thing ever. Uh, but uh, the the new one, he's standing, kind of normal, but he has his arms out, like, in front of him, sort of, and it was this big, so people are calling him five dollar <laughs> foot long Jesus now. So, uh, uh, that's where that name comes from. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's actually not far from um, where I know where Callie used to live, Callie Wright. Um, they've moved, uh, they're just moving, getting ready to move again. But so I'm not sure if she's close to it any longer. But I know the first time I mentioned it uh, to Callie, she's like, oh, that's right near where I live. I drive by that <laughs> thing every damn day. So <laughs> and she, that's down Cincinnati way. So. Yeah, that's that's what I know about Ohio. It's really, really boring to drive through until you get to Touchdown Jesus, and then it's exciting for two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but what you do is far more exciting. So, uh, as you say, you were um, professor at the University of Ohio, is it? Ohio State University. Right Ohio here. State. Hi, I'm thinking the way we name them in Canada, sorry. So Ohio sure. State University, and uh, what exactly do you teach there? I teach in Decision Sciences Collaborative in the History Department. I focus on decision-making in politics and business. That's what I research and teach on similar topics. Excellent, excellent. That's always something we need to know more about. But you've gotten on... Um, uh, 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 I don't know, a campaign, I guess. And it's the the main thrust of it is something called the Pro Truth Pledge. And I have to say that slowly because I tried to say it quickly earlier and it didn't come out very well. <laughs> Thank you for slowing down. <laughs> So, and, and I know you've been sort of making the rounds and, and talking a lot about that. So, um, if you could just summarize sort of what that is and, and why it's important. Sure, happy to do so. So, for folks who are following along and are by computer, I'd recommend that you go to protruthpledge.org. So, again, the website is protruthpledge.org. So, you can follow along with us and see what we're chatting about. So if you go to this website, you'll see that the first thing that comes up is a thing that says, tired of politicians who will say anything to get elected. The pro-truth mm -hmm. pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians 
and everyone else to commit to truth-oriented behavior. And that's what it is. It's a pledge where everyone, including public figures, are committing to truth-oriented behavior. The purpose of it is to reverse the tide of politics that's been so, so big in the United States, in the UK recently. I mean, the United States with Trump, she's so much stuff, so much yeah. lies, so much deception. And really, we don't have much effective ways of preventing it. People are believing Trump, so he is believable. He's very convincing in his line, and people are buying it. Very many people are buying it. So if you look at polls, for example, when he says that um, he won the popular election, the popular vote in the election, when he actually lost by 3 million votes to Hillary Clinton, well, over half of Republicans believe that Trump won the popular vote. So they believe that. And when he said that Obama wiretapped Trump Tower in the 2016 election, I mean, no evidence at all of that. No evidence. And most Republicans believe that. I think the latest poll I saw was that 40-ish percent of people in the United States believe that. Well, so, it's, it's ridiculous the things that I've seen supposedly come out of that man's mouth that are just like... I'm in Canada and I see it and I'm like, well, there's no damn way that's true. And yet <laughs> people are just absorbing this as, and, and it doesn't seem to matter when he's proven wrong. They seem to come up with some excuse as to why yeah. somebody is saying that he's wrong when he isn't or why. Yeah. Like 3 million people voted illegally. Like when you yes. confront them with the yeah. facts, they'll just be like, oh, well, those three million don't count. Those were illegal votes. So he did win the popular vote. And, you know, it's just excuse after excuse that they'll come up with. And it's well, it's like I was saying before the show with you, Morgan. I mean, I've, I've been in discussions recently, too recently, uh, concerning the health care. Hmm. And this one woman was like, well, the best example is Pat Toomey came out today. <clears throat> on a national, regional newscast and said that people on Medicaid will not lose their Medicaid. That is a fucking lie. Mm -hmm. The simple, yeah. simple fact, I mean, if, if you look at the bill, how it's structured, and yes, I have read it, I have a headache from it, <laughs> but... And and they they've called them out on this. And not only is Toomey saying it, Conway is saying it, Price is saying it, um, a couple other uh, politicians are saying it. It's an outright lie. But people mm -hmm. don't care. And like I was talking with this woman the other day about health care. Going to come out of my mouth quite a bit today. She's like, well. I'm just sick of illegal immigrants getting health care, free health care. And I'm like, they can't. Yeah. I'm not saying that it does not happen, that fraud is not happening. But illegal immigrants cannot in any way, shape, or form, except for two caveats that I know of, which predate Obamacare, by the way. That's EMTALA, and I've talked about it before. It's the Emergency Medical Act, that if you go to a hospital, they have to stabilize you. Yeah, insurance thing, and also there is what's called emergency Medicaid, which primarily gets used for pregnancies. It, you know, an immigrant goes in and you know is pregnant and has a child. They have to treat it. Yeah, it's a program that states apply to the federal government to get reimbursed for that care. Okay, that's two caveats to that thing. But in general, if I was an illegal immigrant, I cannot walk into into the welfare office and come out with Medicaid. You do not qualify. The 1996 Reform Act stipulates that. So, and I said this to this woman. So then she moves to go post. Well, I'm talking about all aid. I'm like, uh, no, we were talking about Medicaid. Hmm. You just don't care. Yeah. yeah, it's really hard to get people to care. This is a really challenging thing. So the effort that I've been working on with a number of other behavioral scientists and other reason-oriented notables is to how do you get people to care about truth and politics? And what the research suggests is that you don't get them to care by confronting them with facts. Unfortunately, that's what the research shows. If you give them facts, if you give them facts, 
they will actually shut down emotionally if they're not already logic oriented if they're not reason oriented now the major the listeners for this show are reason oriented people they are rational reason oriented people they can argue the facts however what research shows is something very counterintuitive. When I first learned about it, it was very surprising to me, that if you give people who aren't reason-oriented, if you give them facts that counteract their ideology, their worldview, they will shut down. They will try to find excuses for why their worldview is still correct, and they won't update their beliefs. And that comes about because what happens is emotional triggering. Their emotions get triggered, they get flooded, and they can't admit to themselves that they're wrong. They would rather say that, no, you're wrong than they are wrong. Whereas reason-oriented people are, would say something like, I'm glad to find out I'm wrong. Now I can update my beliefs and be more right. That's wonderful. <laughs> However, yeah, that, I wish that's, that happened. Yes, but that's not the way that the vast majority of the population thinks. So what the research suggests we need to do in order to engage with these people successfully is to first get them to commit to truth-oriented behavior. This is based on research on science popularization. You know, how do you talk about, let's say, global warming? You can do a global warming denial. You can first say, well, you know, hey, global warming happens, here's the facts, and they won't listen to you. Or you can say, hey, here's how science works. You know, people have an idea, and then they do an experiment, and they test out the experiment. They see if it makes sense. If not, they revise it, and they go for their data. And let's talk together about how would you conduct experiments to see whether global warming takes place or not. And then you go them, you lead them for the kind of experiments that are conducted, they are much more likely to believe that global warming, human-caused global warming is real if they come along with you. And if you don't start from the facts about global warming, but you start from the facts about how science works. Similarly, the Pro-Truth Pledge is meant to do a similar thing around truth in general. So for folks who are following along at protruthpledge.org, you can yeah. see that it leads, that it talks about 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows are correlated with truth-oriented behaviors. I'll read some of them to you just for, if, for those who aren't on the website right now. And for those who aren't on our by computer, you can just go to protruthpledge.org and read along. So one is verify. Fact check information to confirm it is true before accepting and sharing it. Another is sharing the whole truth, even if some aspects don't support my opinion, so not lying by mission. Another is reevaluating. Reevaluate if my information is challenged and retract it if I can't verify it. Another is to defer. Recognize the opinion of experts such as scientists as more likely to be accurate when the facts are disputed. And celebrate. Celebrate those who retract incorrect statements and update their beliefs toward the truth. And there are seven more behaviors like this. So if you get people to first commit to these behaviors and agree that they are a good idea, then you can have a central binding contract, a central binding agreement where you can specify and clearly see if someone is following these behaviors or not, in a similar way to science education where you see if someone is using the scientific method or not. So having this agreement is really helpful to get people to be more truth-oriented. I like the idea of um, celebrating people who say, hey, I, I screwed up, this is wrong, and, and here's the correct information. Because coming from, I, I do a lot of debating online, uh, mostly with various stripes of theists. And one thing that, that always strikes me is if is that they say you know well science changes all the time and that's bad and they they like to pick on well so and so atheists change their mind like it's a bad thing and it's like no like you're it's a good thing you're supposed to change your mind when you get new information so mm -hmm. I, I really I like that because we do need to celebrate uh, and and acknowledge people who are able to come out and say you know what I used to think this way and I learned this information and now I don't think that way and instead of you know allowing others to say oh well you're fickle you change your mind <laughs> blah 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 be like hey that's awesome can i find can i know more about what it was that changed your mind because i i should investigate that you know yeah absolutely and that's what the behavior is meant to do to help people 
be comfortable changing their minds. In America, we have this very negative term, flip-flopper, for politicians yes. who change their minds. Just thinking about that, because you always hear, well, that politician, you know, 10 years ago, they said something completely different. I'm like, well, it was 10 fucking years ago. Ooh. So they learned something, you know, like, I, I heard that a lot to do with Hillary. Well, she flip-flopped, and now she's saying everything that Bernie said, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't know, and I mean, I don't know enough about Hillary to say for sure, but I'm like, hey, let's consider the idea that she listened to what Bernie had to say. And went, well, shit, maybe that's a good idea. Yeah, you know? maybe it's a good well, idea. A good, a good a good example is President Obama's uh, change of heart concerning LGBTQI issues. Mm-hmm. Yes. He yes. Was, when he careful. took office, he was against gay marriage. Plain mm-hmm. and simple. He, uh, you know, what is it, three, four years down the road, because of his daughters being the age that they were, and they are generally, that you know, that age of a child is generally more accepting of LGBTQI. QI issues, he mm-hmm. changed his mind. Yeah, and that's he very admirable. Flip flop. You know, yeah. But I'm going to play kind of Debbie Downey here because <laughs> I deal a lot with <laughs> with anti vaccination, mm-hmm. science denial. I yeah. mean, most of the people I deal with deny even the scientific method. Mm-hmm. They twist it so badly that it's mm-hmm. not even a reflection of what you and I would consider the scientific method. How do you deal with somebody who um, denies it that badly? I mean, how can you find a common ground with somebody that, I mean, it goes beyond well, beyond the science was wrong before. How do you sure. deal with a person that's... Yeah, so there are a couple of things that you want to think about. In some ways, it's going to be hard to reach some people and you don't want to necessarily reach everyone. You want to reach the reachable. I think uh, what we're talking about with some people who don't know the way that science works, they think that, oh, if science was wrong before and now it's right, that means, you know, it's wrong now. Well, science, they don't understand that that science is simply the best information that we currently have available as opposed Mm -hmm. to definitely the truth. Science is the best thing that we currently have available out of all possible information. And we know that some aspects will be changed in the future, and that's fine. But, you know, you're not going to go and say, oh, I know better than the scientists about climate change or about, you know, uh, vaccines or something like that, because you didn't spend many years studying this topic and looking at all the research and conducting all the experiments Mm -hmm. being steeped in this field. So that refers to the general aspect of expertise. And what I, in, what I generally talk about with people who are anti-vaccine, who are anti-vaccinators, anti-vaxxers, stuff like that, climate change deniers, is to say, hey, you know, who would you trust to fix your car? Would you trust the mechanic to fix your car? Or do you want to go to your politician to fix your car? Now, next time you go to your politician to fix your car, you let me know how he does. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, well, and it, it's it's like you know, they say, "Well, oh, vaccines bad, blah blah blah." Well, does that mean that you won't go to a doctor? Because you know, immunologists are generally doctors or in the medical field and have a lot of the same um, education as the guy who says, "You know, you need to lower your blood pressure." So, if you're gonna throw out what they're saying then why are you trusting the guy that says, hey, here's some medication for cholesterol, right? I like to go go with more kind of colloquial examples uh, that the the more distant they are from the topic at hand, the less triggered they're likely Mm -hmm. to be. So you want to think about triggering. So kind of try to avoid going to doctors, go to like car mechanic or something like that. Right. Yeah, most most of your anti-vaxxers do not go to doctors either. If they, they go to doctors, yeah. yeah, I think. Yeah, I, if they I go think to a doctor, it's either a homeopath or a naturopath. Okay, I think at that stage you you, you don't need to continue the conversation with them. <laughs> you know, you you yeah, want I to wish talk. it was that easy. I hear you, but uh, I'm here. I'm being serious. You want to reach the reachable. I mean, 
if we think uh, back to, Clint to Hillary Clinton's statement that half of Trump's supporters are in the deplorables basket, now I don't know if it's half or not, but I think the general gist of what she's saying is accurate in the sense that some of Trump's supporters are not going to be reachable. Some are. So for example, um, if you folks know about what the uh, Rotary Club is, that's a yeah. conservative Christian mm -hmm. organization. So when you go to their meeting, the first thing they do in the United States, at least, I don't know what they do in Canada, but in the United States, they do the Pledge of Allegiance and then a prayer to the Christian God. Mm -hmm. So it's a conservative Christian themed organization. And we have members of the Pro Truth Pledge Volunteering Network. We had a member go to a Rotary Club here in Columbus, Ohio, and give a presentation to the Rotary Club, and 25% of the membership signed to the Pro Truth Pledge. Now, huh. That's, you know, you're making inroads because they can agree on these 12 behaviors. They can say, yes, these 12 behaviors make sense. You want to celebrate updating that will lead to truth-oriented behavior. You want to fact check that will lead to truth-oriented behaviors. Now, if you get uh, those people, get them signed up, and you have a lot of conservatives, uh, Republican politicians, they give presentations to Rotary Club members because Rotary Club members are essentially made up of um, it's kind of an elite organization. Only community leaders are invited to join it. So oh. people who are considered kind of, you know, business pro leaders and so on. So the one who was making the presentation to the Rotary Club was a business owner. So that's why she was invited to make the presentation. Right. And she was, she was able to get there. So, and she gave the presentation. They signed up. These are, uh, these are venues where politicians are trying to get their support. Conservative politicians are going there to get support, both financial support and community influencer support. Now, if those conservative politicians are not going to sign the pro-truth pledge and the members of the Rotary Club are gonna sign the pro-truth pledge, the members of the Rotary Club are less likely to support those politicians. So yeah, this, no, is, so this is a, a thing that appeals across the partisan divide. And this is why it's very important. We are appealing across the partisan divide. We are appealing across the religious divide. We have an Episcopal bishop who signed the pro-truth pledge. You know, so we are, this is something that appeals to people. It's a broad-based movement. And the more people who can get on board, the more people go to protruthpledge.org and sign the pledge, the more power we'll have to get other people to sign it. And I can talk about the details of how that works. Yeah, no, that's that's a good idea. And like, do you foresee something like this? Maybe um, like, I don't know a lot about the CPAC thing, but that just popped into my head as like, hey, what if you could get somebody to talk about this at something like CPAC? Because I, I we've talked to David Silverman before and he talked about him showing up at CPAC and going, hey, I'm an atheist and finding out, holy shit, there are, con there are conservative atheists that were glad to see me. So I, it makes me think that something like CPAC would be a good place to, because uh, that's the kind of venue where, let's just say, more of the truth challenged kind of person might sure. show up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. CPAC can be a venue if we get a person with connections there. We're able to get into the Rotary Club because we had a business owner who had yeah. connections there who, who can get it. So it's all about connections. So the more people we're able to go to Pro Truth Pledge at Oregon sign up, the more connections we're able to make. So, for example, we want to go into churches, conservative churches and liberal churches alike, and get people to sign up. You know, and that's great. We want people to, we have volunteers going to festivals of various sorts and getting people across the political divide to sign up. That's great. I mean, uh, we're getting various influencers and notables to sign up. I mean, Peter Singer signed the Pro Truth Pledge. Uh, mm -hmm. Dan Barker signed the Pro Truth Pledge. So uh, August Brunsman, the uh, executive director of the Secular Student Alliance, signed the pledge. Herb Silverman from the uh, Secular Coalition for America signed the pledge. A number of people, Aaron Ra, um, Noah Legends, Thomas Smith. We have a number of people who signed the Pro Truth Pledge and they are telling their fans to sign it. So we're getting a lot of people who have influence in the community signing up and then they're conveying it to their local to their networks. So it's a network-based idea. So it's spread for your network. So for folks who are following along, if they go, if they're on ProTruthPledge.org, they can click on the orange button that says take the pledge and I'll show you how it works. 
So you put your name in, your last name, your email, those are required. You put your phone in, that's important to get action alerts, which we'll get to in a bit. Then you put your home address. The goal of that is so that we can tell your representatives how many people have signed the pledge. And okay. one of the boxes says, I call all of my elected representatives to take the approach of pledge. That's everyone from your district judge to your mayor, to your state house representative, to your congressperson, senator, president, and so on. And the same for equivalent office in Canada. So we have people in Canada who are doing this. And then we have volunteers. So one of the things that you can do is help with the pro truth pledge. And one of the things you can do, and which we already have people doing, is going to these senators, to these Congress people, you know, federal district judges and whatnot, and saying, hey, this is how many people from your districts, this is how many representatives signed the pro truth pledge asking you to take the pro truth pledge. So how about you take the pro truth pledge? So that functions as a petition in that way and gets them to consider, it gets our foot in the door for them to consider taking the pro truth pledge. Then you can sign up to email updates and action alerts. And here we get to the, another important part. So for public figures, and public figures is everyone who has an influence in the public sphere. You three as podcasters are public figures. I'm a public figure as a commentator and author and you know, professor and so on. And yeah. this goes all the way up to the president, you know, ministers, secular group leaders, everyone is considered a public figure. These are people who have an impact on the public sphere. And public figures have an opportunity to provide a paragraph about why they chose to take the pledge and mm -hmm. then links to their online presence. So, you know, if you sign, if you sign the Pro Truth Pledge, it might be links to your website, to your Patreon page, to your social media, to the, the podcast and so on. So whatever you want to give. And then from that point, that's where uh, that gets sent around to people in a monthly, something like monthly newsletter who signed up to the email updates. So that gives a reputation bonus to people who are truth oriented. And so that draws audience focus of the audience of people toward people who are truth oriented as opposed to people who are did not publicly pr proclaim their commitment to the truth. And so here we have a benefit, a reputational benefit for people who are truth oriented. Then what we have is people put a badge on their website who signed up the pro truth pledge you know, podcasters often do a short intro at the beginning of their podcast saying, hey, we signed the Pro Truth Pledge, hold us accountable, and so on. And bloggers do something like that in their articles. So whatever kind of venue you do. So that's kind of a way to convey to your audience that you are trustworthy and trustable. Another right. benefit, especially for politicians, is that they can attack their opponents if their opponents didn't take the Pro Truth Pledge. So for example, here in Congress, here in Ohio, we have in the congressional district uh, 12, uh, the two Democratic candidates took the pro-truth pledge. We're going to the Republican incumbent to see if he will take the pro-truth pledge. And if he won't, the Democrats will be able to attack him for not taking the pro-truth pledge. So it has a strong incentive. There's an incentive for politicians to take the pro-truth pledge as a tool for themselves. Okay, so one thing that just popped into my mind when you're talking about um, people putting the badge on their website and um, things like that or on their blog. Now, what if there's some jerk out there who decides, well, I'm just going to take that label and stick it on my website, whether they, you know, pledge to do anything or not. So that I could see very, a, a number of people I could think of off the top of my head that might do something like that. <laughs> Definitely. So here, so if they take, so this is, goes under FAQ free, uh, oh. how are pledge takers held accountable? So for people who are on the website and for who are following along, you can click on FAQ free, how are pledge takers held accountable and check it out while I talk through it. So we have a mechanism for holding pledge takers accountable. For private citizens, so large majority of your listeners, that involves essentially community accountability. So yeah. people who take the pro-truth pledge, we encourage them to share publicly that they took the pro-truth pledge. That has several benefits. Now, research shows that if you do a pro-social behavior, your network is likely to do it as well. For example, if you donate to a cause and are public about it, your network, social network, is likely to do so as well, much more likely. 
If you stop smoking, your social network is likely to stop smoking. If you lose weight, your social network is likely to lose weight and you know, in noticeable weight. And similarly, if you take the pro-truth pledge, yours and are public about it, your social network is likely to take it as well. So you have a positive impact on them. And then by stating it, you, they help hold you accountable to make sure that you stick to these behaviors. So, and you have an opportunity also to join a group of pledge takers. And that's only for people who volunteer to help with the pro-truth pledge. So we have Facebook groups and Slack channel and so on for people who want to join a community of pledge takers. We're also developing in-person communities. So right now they're mostly online, but we're also developing in-person ones. So that's the uh, first. Then uh, for public figures is a salient one where we as the pledge organizers get involved. Anyone who takes the approach of pledge as a can immediately volunteer to help. One of the ways you can help is monitoring public figures. And there's a database of public figures who took the approach of pledge and you can check that out. So you can take a look for public figures or you can get in contact and you'll be assigned a public figure or several to monitor. And then you'll be monitoring these public figures to make sure that they're sticking to the facts and not spreading misinformation. And we have specific definitions mm -hmm. of what that means. Now, if you find that someone is spreading something that you believe is a piece of misinformation, we ask that you approach them privately and clarify the situation. This is not a gotcha game. This is not meant to kind of be publicity. When I was talking to Aaron Ra about this, he was like, well, will people make YouTube videos about mistakes I make? He was like, well, he gets enough of that already. And I said, no, this is not the point. <laughs> the point is to approach the person privately, subtly, and say with an innocent until proven guilty kind of approach, you know, hey, uh, you said this thing, I'm not sure it's correct. Can you clarify if I misheard it or you misspoke or something like that? And then it very often gets clarified that way. So for example, we have a congressperson candidate in Idaho, a representative who, running for Congress in Idaho, who posted on his Facebook wall a tweet from Donald Trump that was uh, saying something critical about disabled children classrooms. Now, when it was when the Donald Trump's tweet was looked through, we couldn't find the tweet there, so kind of called him out and it said like, "Hey, what's up?" Kind of behind the scenes, and yeah. then he uh, looked through the tweet. He couldn't find it, and he edited the statement to say, "Hey, I couldn't find the original feed. It might have been deleted, or this might have been a Photoshop thing to look like Donald Trump said it." So he edited the statement. He retracted it, and we celebrated the updating. That's great. Now that's yeah. one outcome. That's great. Now, if that if the public figure refuses to retract the statement, and if you still, as a volunteer, have concerns about it, you can go to a mediating committee. So this is kind of crowdsourcing the truth. In the same way that Wikipedia, anyone can be a Wikipedia editor and go behind the scenes and try to edit an article, that's great. Now, we have a second level of uh, vetted volunteers so that people don't troll the pro-truth pledge. So these vetted volunteers, are like the Wikipedia editors, people who have been through the process for a long time who are trusted by other Wikipedia members, editors. So they have social capital that way. So they evaluate the situation, investigate, they contact the public figure, they see what's going on. Now, if the public figure at that stage still refuses to retract it, and if they're pretty certain that this is a piece of misinformation, here's where we come to understanding that the public figure deliberately lied. And the lie is deliberately sharing misinformation. You know, anyone can make a mistake. Lie, by dictionary definition, is an intent to deceive. So that's what yeah. the process of pledge really aims to address. So that's when the clause come out. Well, as described in the FAQ, at that stage, uh, we go to the media. So for example, let's say it's the mayor of Cleveland uh, in Ohio. Then yeah. we email and get in touch with all the media venues in the Cleveland area. We also, this is why it's important to sign up for action alerts, we send out an action alert by email and text to all the people who mm -hmm. sign up for this. And they ask all the pledge signees in the Cleveland area to email the mayor, tweet the mayor, write the mayor, call the mayor, meet with the mayor, protest the mayor's office, do everything, kind of raise a big stink about the mayor being in contempt of the pro-truth pledge. And we also list it on the website. So it's a pretty big hit to somebody's reputation yeah. if they deliberately lie. If they want to lie, they're better off not taking the approach of pledge at all. 
Right. Okay. So then on the flip side of that, going back to what Aaron Ross said, and I can understand it because I've seen some of the stuff people have said uh, in regards to him. But what if you also get somebody, like you said, you you shouldn't be able to troll the pledge, but mm-hmm. I think there are people that will try. And sure, so what if somebody doesn't you know, honor the idea of, hey, we approach the person privately, but, you know, watches our and raw video and just goes, oh, I'm going to start blabbing this everywhere that you lied. In that case, that person doesn't represent the pro-truth pledge. We ask that person, we ask anyone who is honestly representing to the pro-truth pledge to do so privately. And if the person does so publicly, then the person does it on his own initiative. We can't control someone. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, they if yeah, somebody yeah. is doing that they're they're acting sort of the the rank and file members would not be the ones initiating a public calling yes out. yes exactly so the pro so I, I, never I, never in any case when they go public they are not representing the pro truth pledge in that way you know okay. whatever they say sorry beth what yeah, was that I, I, no, I was going to say, like, using her in raw, raw as a, a, an example, case where somebody's actually trolling him and trying to use the truth, pro-truth pledge, um, I, I can't foresee anybody from, like, our community trolling him like that, mm-hmm. because, I mean, <clears throat> it's going to be a dickwad. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be sure. somebody who's going to troll him anyways. Because I mean, if yeah. uh, I mean, now that he's becoming more politically active and he's going, he's running in, in Texas mm-hmm. for for a position. But like, I like you, I've seen some of the comments, especially on his anti-creationism videos, yeah. and it's just like yeah. these people are. I mean, are just <sighs> easily destroyed because they don't know what they're talking about. Sure. Yep. It's so. Just, yeah, I mean, I mean, I can I can see the the uh, possibilities of where somebody could take this, but I can't really like you know, in, in someone in Arn's case, I can't see anybody really getting very far because right from the aspect that the, that he's very accurate. Now, somebody like me, where most of my work is <clears throat> is opinion piece, <clears throat> mm-hmm. although I try to base my opinion on fact, for lack mm-hmm. of a better word. And I always, you know, present where I'm getting my notions from and what, you know, what information I'm using to support it. I probably would have a, have a harder time if somebody decided to troll me because it's, oh, it yeah. is a matter of a, a matter of opinion. So mm-hmm. I, I think in some ways when you're dealing with fact and uh, versus opinion, mm-hmm. there would be that uh, battle going on. When, yeah. for the but I like the, I yeah. like the pro-truth pledge we have one of the behaviors is distinguishing between my opinion and the facts so as long as you're doing that Mm -hmm. uh, you can take the pledge fine and like i said no one uh, who publicly goes out to criticize someone like saying oh hey you're not sticking to the pro-truth pledge they're not speaking for the pro-truth pledge in that case though you know so there's a specific procedure that's followed yes exactly so you can tell right away if somebody is not following that procedure, then they're just being a dick. <laughs> exactly. They're just being a dick and they're not speaking for the pro-truth pledge at all. So that's why we say, you know, you approach the person privately, you know, with a innocent until proven guilty, not like saying, hey, you liar. Why did you lie? You liar. <laughs> You know, that's not that's not what we want to do. And it's something that always drives me crazy when I'm debating theists because they love to throw out, well, you're a liar. And what they mean when they say that is you won't agree with me. And (laughs) you still count you're still contradicting what I say. They don't seem to understand that the intent has to be there, that you are willfully disseminating false information. Just because you think I'm wrong and that you think I should know I'm wrong doesn't mean that I am in fact wrong. (laughs) Correct. 
Yeah, yeah and I see that a lot with this administration, especially with, you know, all the nonsense that's being thrown at people. It's very easy to say, oh, Donald Trump did this thing or the Photoshop tweets. Like I've seen several uh, Photoshop tweets of things, you know, because he tweets such horrible things. Yes. It's very easy to think, oh, my gosh, he tweeted this crazy thing about disabled kids. And so you share it. And so I think that with most people, especially with reason oriented, but I think that this is a good approach to handle it with a private message first and saying, hey, that's that tweet wasn't real. You know, maybe you should take that down or edit to clarify your comments that it probably isn't real. I think that's a much better approach than just saying like, oh, you're lying and just trying to make Donald Trump look bad. And yeah, yeah. Because I think most people are coming from a good place. Yes. Are they doing things like that? But they, it's just it, they don't know because it, it is. It's it's such it nonsense made, coming at us. It's made yeah. me think because there have been times where people have shared stuff uh, comes through my news feed and I've like, oh, I've already like news stories where that, you know, they sound too good to be true. So I've mm -hmm. gone to look them up and but the other person has just shared it. And I've actually just gone on the comments and said, oh, I'm pretty sure that was debunked and I'll like throw up a Snopes link or something. And now I'm thinking, hmm, maybe that was even a little too public, you know. Yeah, but in the research I suggests, burn by that. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Research suggests that that is not the best approach because people feel triggered in those sorts of cases. Right. So what you want to do is really try your best to avoid triggering people. And so that's why when we approach, when we encourage people to approach someone, we don't say, you know, approach them and say, hey, I think you've, you shared this piece of misinformation. It's something like, hey, you know, I was wondering where you got this, you know, maybe I misheard you or, you know, maybe you misstated something. I'm not sure this is accurate. Can you clarify it? I that's a much better word. And I actually, I actually recognize that from my call center days. I used to train uh, people for call center. And that was one of the things that we used to train people was um, to when you were trying to um, point someone in what you knew to be a better direction, you don't get accusatory. So for instance, uh, like I used to work for a credit card company. And so one of the things we would train agents to say was not, you didn't pay your bill last month. It was, we didn't receive your payment last month. So mm -hmm. the onus becomes on you where you're saying, hey, I didn't get it. Would you like to to help me figure out why I didn't get it instead of, well, you didn't pay it because yeah. now you're being accusatory and they're like, what do you mean I didn't pay my bills? I always pay my bills. And <laughs> that's yep. So I, when you say it that way, I'm like, ding, oh yeah, that's that's exactly what I used to train people back in, in the call center. In yes, and the, the, the people are the same in call centers and online debates, you know? Oh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw we saw that with with uh, with Twatwa from the number one. She, yes, we, you and I both presented information, learning her views on uh, being transgender. Oh, I at one point said, "Oh, I stand correct." Oh, it was, uh, you know, I stand corrected. Blah blah blah. And then she went on and did the exact same thing. Right? It did. And I had noticed, like, the next day or the day or two after, that she was still posting garbage. <laughs> yeah. It's like, sometimes this is like, you'll get somebody to admit that they may be wrong. Mm -hmm. And they just go ahead and do it anyways. So it's like, it's like you said, like, for me, one of the biggest things that I've had to do is the person that I am debating or having a conversation with if it's online reading what i'm writing mm -hmm. you know who's reading the information i'm presenting the people that are on the fence so i, I kind of combine the two because i know talk, most of the people i talk to i could talk to them bloom bloom in the face and they're not they're not going to yeah. accept anything i said but they're not the people i'm talking to i'm talking sure. to the audience yeah you need to think about who you're talking to and that's that's yeah. a good point. So, but it does look more effective if you talk to the audience, if you 
present yourself in a way that's sensitive and yeah. uh, thoughtful, then the audience is more likely to sympathize with you. And if you present yourself in a way... I think it's the know, thoughtful part now. <laughs> yeah. no, I don't know. I can be a little rough around the edges. Well, and I tend to be pretty blunt. So that's why, you know, when I see... And, and when somebody... Like, there's been a couple of times, well, more than a couple of times, but there's been times where I've seen a news story, and the one I'm thinking of, there was a fake story going around a few months ago that said the, ter the Church of Scientology had lost its tax-exempt status. And we can't stand Scientology. We've done lots of shows about Scientology, and I was like, yeah! And I shared it, and, like, as soon as I shared it, I was like, wait a minute. The ex-Scientologists we know have not said anything about this. Hang on. And I went and did, you know, looked around at actual news outlets because I looked at like, wait a minute, what website was that? And it wasn't one I knew. And then I was like, I don't see anything on like actual news outlets. And the Scientologists, ex-Scientologists I know aren't talking about this. Uh, wait a minute, and and then I took it down because I was like, well, shit, that was, I was mad, too, because I was like, damn it, I really wanted to celebrate that shit, but, sure. you no, know, sure. it was wrong, but if somebody had posted to me and said, oh, that's totally not true, and gave me a, a, a Snopes link or something, I don't know, I think, depending on my mood, I might be like, oh, shit, that sucks, thank you, or, you know, well, couldn't you have told me that better? So, yeah, yeah. you're right. It, it, it does make a difference. Like, I'm not always going to be offended by that, but if I was having a bad day and I was kind of cranky, I might be annoyed by that. So, yeah. yeah it's, it's not only you. You are kind of at the extreme edge of the population and being reason-oriented. So uh, imagine people who are much less reason-oriented than you are. It's much harder for them to orient yeah. toward updating their beliefs. So this is why these strategies are very effective. And what is really helpful for conversations is to get people to encourage them to take the pro-truth pledge before you have the conversation. And so get people to agree on the tenets of the pledge, like, hey, can you take the pro-truth pledge and let's agree to stick by it? And then you can have a conversation. And that's a very effective way to proceed forward. I should try that the next time I debate, like, some really whack theorists. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, guess I, I could just see, see how, uh, and, and I'm kind of making a joke here, and I'm not, but I could just see you trying to pull that off in the crazy group. I was just thinking, there's a group that, that, well, I think all of us are in it now. It's a Facebook group. I, somebody added it to me, like, a couple of years ago. And it's, we call it affectionately the crazy group because there are people that believe things in there that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> it's water like, is it, God. and yeah, water is God. Um, you know, people who believe in lizard people and yeah, lizard people. You know, there's there's even and and there's some super asshole atheists in there too. So don't get it's like both ends of the crazy spectrum. Okay. Okay. But uh, well, I could just imagine, you know, because I debate a lot of like mm -hmm. woo uh, people yeah. in here coming up with, well, before I engage with you in this discussion, here's a website. I want you to read these tenets and agree to this before we yeah, start. Yeah, that would be great. I should, but it would be yeah. hilarious. None you of sure. them. Tell me, tell me how it works. I'd be really curious. <laughs> I should. Or you know what? Oh, Beth, because I know the interesting. Yes. Sorry, what? I was going to say it would be a very interesting experiment, and I don't mean to make light of the the, the pledge itself. But, but I, oh, your bandwidth's going crazy again, girl. <laughs> maybe they're in the group that tells you on there. Talk. Well, I was just thinking, because I'm acquainted with uh, the guy who founded the group, I should approach him and be like, hey, can you put this in the group, girls? Well, that would be great. 
I don't know that he, I don't think he, he's kind of loopy too. And he's, he's a nice man. I've actually talked to him on the phone before, but oh. he's a little, a little out there um, for various reasons. But um, I, I may actually try that and see if he'll bite. <laughs> yeah. Now, is there any efforts being made? So you said that the majority of people are not reason oriented. Are there any efforts being made right now to make people more reason-oriented, or is that just a lost cause at this point? The pro-truth pledge is a way of doing that. So the pro-truth pledge is essentially a way of getting people to be more reason-oriented. There is research showing that if people commit to, I'll give you an example. If people commit to a code of honor, if students commit to a code of honor prior to taking tests, they're more likely to be honest on the tests. And this applies to a number of instances. If people commit to a code of honor prior to filling out a form or taking uh, various uh, doing things like tax forms, they're more likely to be honest on these things. So the pro-truth pledge is a way of changing our society, of getting people to be more honest. That's one way. One is you take the pro-truth pledge and get them to take it. Second, the behaviors in the pro-truth pledge. So if you look at the pro-truth pledge, one of the behaviors asks people to fix, ask people to retract information with reliable sources of this proof, even if they're my, my allies, and compassionately inform those around me to stop using unreliable sources, even if those sources support my opinion. So, you know, whether Breitbart News on the right side or Occupy Democrats on the left, both are mm -hmm. bad sources. So yeah. you essentially, you get the internal motivation of people taking the pledge, and you get the external motivation of your community around you being more rational, more reason-oriented by practicing these behaviors. And the pledge thems itself gives guidelines for essentially what is reason-oriented behavior. What, and reason-oriented behavior is behavior that is most likely to result in an accurate evaluation of reality. So kind of getting at the base of what reason-oriented behavior means. You have an accurate evaluation of reality. So that's what the pledge is meant to do. And the more people engage in this, we are launching essentially a movement to change our society in the same way that the environmental movement changed our society to care about the environment, to care about clean air and water. It was launched in the 1970s. We're launching a movement to get people to care about the truth. And we're using a lot of the strategies that have worked for the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. So strategies like raising awareness, you know, one of the fundamental aspects of the environmental movement that made it mainstream was the publication of Silent Spring in 1962 by Rachel Carson, which got people to really think about the environment and care about the environment, their health, and so on. The Pro-Truth Pledge does some of the same things, and Rachel Carson then talked about what you can do. The Pro-Truth Pledge does some of the same things. It talks about the danger of lies in politics and what you can specifically and concretely do to address this problem in your society, your own behavior, and those of others and then get politicians and other public figures to take it. So it really changes the dynamics in our society to tilt it toward truth instead of lies. Well, I, well just quickly, I was going to say, just looking at the items that are listed, um, I see the characteristics of critical thinking in yes. those behaviors. And so it's it's you're teaching critical thinking without telling them you're teaching them critical thinking basically. That's exactly right. Yes. <laughs> Which rolls into my my question if you're familiar with the 2012 Texas platform one of their educational point points was they wanted to eliminate critical thinking in schools. Yes. Yep. Uh, how is your outreach towards education towards the schools. I mean, are you doing anything yeah. like that we are. in a way we to are. combat that? We are. So we have a principal who is in charge of a middle school in Florida, and he is currently working on adapting the Pro-Truth Pledge principles to his curriculum uh, for his school. And what he'll, what he'll be doing is creating a module that will be adapted to the requirements of education for the Florida standardized teaching program, the common core, stuff like that. And then what he'll do is for each of the 12 behaviors, students will have a module where they spend a week on the behavior. They will create a podcast or a blog or something like that themed around the behavior. They'll have relevant readings and so on. 
And so he will test run it as an initial series of things and perfect it over time. So then we'll have a standardized sort of curriculum that we can offer to other schools that want to implement it. Deb, you know what this reminds me of? Chris What's DiCarlo. That? I was thinking that myself. Chris <laughs> so uh, uh, Chris DiCarlo is um, a local um, philosophy professor who uh, he's written a couple of books, one of which is called How to Be a Really Great Pain in the Ass. <laughs> but um, he's, he's actually um, worked with our um, provincial government here and he's instituted a critical thinking curriculum in mm -hmm. our uh, high school um, curriculum so it, it was a last year was um, just the test run it's uh, curriculum or, or school wide this year um, and he's consulting with other countries on this he was even asked to go to China and talk about it so um, yeah, it's it's we're we're trying. We are. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> and well, and we he spoke. Um, there was a conference here uh, about three weeks ago, and uh, he was one of the speakers. And somebody said, "Are we going to the United States?" And he's <laughs> like, <"I'm> "Trying." <laughs> so, <laughs> we need yeah. more of that here. Well, tell him if you're in touch with him. Tell him about the pro truth pledge. Encourage him to take it. I shall. I shall. He may have heard about it. I don't know. I'll have to see. I'll definitely have to see because uh, I think he'd be very interested for sure. So, but it's coming up. By, uh, you said uh, you had to yeah. go about an hour. So, um, I, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate that. And before you go and we, we start blabbing about all kinds of other things, um, please uh, tell us. Uh, I know you said it was Pro Truth. I want to call it a truth. I don't know why. ProTruthPledge.org. Um, if there's any other links or things that you want to talk about before you go, please do. Sure. Uh, folks can always email me to learn more if they have any questions at my email, which is gleb, G L E B, at intentionalinsights.org. Again, that's gleb at intentionalinsights.org. And I run I'm the volunteer president of the nonprofit intentionalinsights.org, which is the nonprofit that manages the pledge projects. It's a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit, just oriented toward truth and rational thinking in politics and other areas of life. And again, I encourage everyone to go to protruthpledge.org and take the pledge. And I want to ask you if you three as public figures will take the pro truth pledge yourselves. Yes. I think so. I, I'm thinking it sounds like a good idea. Excellent. Yes. I'm glad to hear it. Well, great. <laughs> this was a pleasure, folks. <laughs> Best right. been having some bandwidth issues there. but Yeah, she, she, she won't take the pledge. She dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> She's back. Well, thank you very much, and uh, sure. have yourself this a great pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So, um... Bye. First of all, um, I just want to say I've got Steve McRae and Atheist Ranger over in the chat, and I, I didn't see you at first, but I see you now. And Steve, I when I right click on the three dots, I don't get Add Moderator at all. So I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, dude. He's he's he was complaining because I didn't make him a moderator in my chat. <laughs> oh. oh, he thinks what? He, oh yeah, a chat moderator. Yeah, well, I, uh, Morgan, you won't know Steve. Um, he is the uh, creator of the Great Debate community over on YouTube and Google Plus, and uh, I've been hanging out with those guys a bit lately. And so they have a thing that when they do um, live hangouts, they they get a lot more chatters than we do, but they um, will assign trusted members to moderate the chat and when they do that there's a little wrench he says it's a spanner i'm like what the fuck is a spanner but whatever and he said he's like it makes me a moderator man like i want to be a moderator i would do it but it doesn't seem to i get a thing that says manage moderators but then it takes me to like a whole page and 
community settings and automated filters and shit. And I don't see your name anywhere, dude. Blue Spanner. Spanner is a wrench. Well, okay. I don't know. My husband does wrenchy things. Wrenchy things? Oh, wrenchy things. <laughs> see, like, I can see man manage participants, but I can't actually do anything when I click on you, so I don't know why that is. Is he yeah, trying to keep us safe from flat earthers? Yes! <laughs> Fucking flat earthers. <laughs> actually, I was with these guys on, what was it, Tuesday or Wednesday night? And on, on Steve's live hangout, we went and trolled live flat earth um, hangouts. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Yes, give them yeah. their, own, their own taste. Oh, yeah. Their it was. Is. Okay, he says he'll figure it out for me later. Awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, this this whole thing that Gleb's talking about, um, I like that. It's like, we're going to teach you critical thinking without telling you that we're teaching you critical thinking. <laughs> yes, it's very much See, needed. And that would be... A in a state like Texas, you're going to have to do it that way with, you know, teach it without them even know you're teaching it. Because exactly. I can see, like, Texas and Louisiana throwing up, and Tennessee now, throwing up a huge thing. And, yeah. and I'll admit, you know, before sp speaking with him, I have been following his, um, his feed and, and stuff like that, but I, I don't know if it preoccupies staying alive, that <laughs> it's just what he was trying to accomplish with the Pro-Truth Pledge was just going over my head. And uh, you and I even talked about it before the show. We kind of thought of it as being redundant. And but in some, in some cases, it might be. Like, I mean, look, like for myself, it might be redundant, but because, and I tell people, even in, even on my blog, anything that I write, if, if you want to counter that, you know, bring, bring it on. I will, I will take a look at the information you have. Like, for an example, I had, I had gotten into a discussion concerning, uh, pot cures cancer. Right. Um, I sense that. And it's just like, he, he, you know, presented all this evidence and I'm like, from what I consider based on, you know, other opinion that I highly regard, and I'm talking like, you know, medical doctors and researchers, that was junk. I'm sorry, anything from Mercola or Natural News is garbage. Yeah, but I think having that, um, signing that pledge and also, like, lets others know that are reading your material that you are willing to be held accountable. And you are taking yeah, it over to the truth. I think that it does help now that it, yeah. And I think that his yeah, explanation. And that's what I was going. That's what I was going to say. Knowing that if if I decide to put that badge on my my website, if I take the pledge, you know, it might add a little bit more weight. I mean, I don't get a shit ton of comments on my blog, which in some cases was probably a good thing because I have enough trouble keeping up, <laughs> but. But for somebody, you know, that is able, you know, uh, I'll say more higher profile individuals than myself who do take the comments that they receive seriously encountering, uh, you know, pseudoscience, for an uh, example, or creationism, I think that's important because, you mm -hmm. know, I, I mean, I seriously, I mean, that's one of the biggest gripes I get from people is that, oh, well, you don't consider the other side. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I do. In fact, I just did a posting the past day where I actually used one of the articles. Granted, I ripped it apart. But yes, I do read the other side. But the other side is not presenting information that is, I'll say, useful. It's just so far out in left field that it's, just, it's delusional. Yeah, well, and, and but you know, Gleb said not everybody's reachable. Like, you want to, yeah, like you're mm -hmm. people who believe the moon is a freaking laser beam that's being beamed up there by NASA. I don't think they're going to, you know, be, yeah, reachable, and, and that's, but I think there are people who, you know, who, you know, might still be because 
I mean, with Donald Trump, it's like, you know, things have been so polarized, but this is also like completely unprecedented and new. And so mm -hmm. I think that we have to at least try to counter it. And I think that there are people who are reachable. It's just they don't know that they're not being engaged in critical thinking. They, again, like I just tell, um, and about how I was had had to take that Christian worldview class back at my crazy school, and I was being taught, "Oh, you're doing critical thinking," when in fact I was being taught apologetics. So right. I think yeah. that these people do think they're doing critical thinking, but don't realize that's not what they're doing. So I think that this pro-truth pledge um, with the platform and attendance that don't, you know, say, scream out, "Oh, this is how you really do critical thinking," is a good way to approach it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I started doing sideways. that. And 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 the yeah. thing is, like, well, then, like what you were saying, well, what we were saying earlier, Beth, about wondering, you know, is this kind of redundant? But when you when you add the, you know, it's redundant to us because we kind of basically mm -hmm. do that. But what yeah. we what we would be doing is teaching other people how to do it too who aren't doing it or or putting ourselves forward as an example of mm -hmm. the right way to do things and like so so when i you know there's two or three times now where something came across my news feed and i was like oh that's so fucking awesome and i shared it and then at every time i figured out myself Oh, fuck, I shouldn't have shared that, you know, it, which, you know, that's good. I did. I just kind of wished I'd have figured it out before I shared it. it but yeah. I've learned from those several times where, okay, even though I see a news story, I'm like, oh, that's fucking amazing. Wait a minute. Is this too good to be true? And I have stopped myself six or eight times now where... I was ready, excuse me, I was ready to share something, and then I went and, well, wait a minute, there's nothing about that on the CBC, and there's nothing about that on, I mean, CNN, eh, but there's still news-ish, and if it's big, it's, you know, like, like the Scientology thing, I'm sure as hell CNN would have had something about that, and, you know, I'm not oh, seeing yeah. it here, I'm not seeing it you know, in other places I would expect to see it, then I'm kind of going, wait a minute, I better hold off on this. And especially if there's no, because there's been a couple of times where I've gone to Snopes and there hasn't been an article yet. So I'm like, oh, fuck. Well, it's not there, but it, I'm not sure. And I can't verify this, so I'm not going to share it. And usually if you can't well, verify like it, that's a good... It's a big old red flag if no one else is verifying yeah. it. It's coming from one place or if they're all coming from a similar place. So I noticed like with um, Gleb brought up Occupy Democrats. So I noticed with things like that, what they'll do is they'll either do something which it says on the pro tree pledge, you know, not to do like they will eliminate certain facts or they will misconstrue facts. Mm -hmm. But you'll see that Occupy Democrats have shared it, and then you'll see a bunch of other sites similar to it have shared it, but no legitimate um, news no sources have shared it. And that's a huge red flag, because when I was going through on the By Skeptical podcast with Trav, and there was a congressman in, um, I can't remember what state now, but he was trying to make it to where gun carriers would have basically civil rights protections and be considered a protected class. So I was going through, he had a memo that was like in support of it and saying, oh, here's all these instances where people were told they couldn't be served at a restaurant because they had like a concealed carry or something. Well, I went through and I was able to easily debunk basically mm -hmm. every single one of those claims. Yep. Well, or at so least cast doubt on them because it was like coming from like a Facebook meme that was shared around on As September eleventh. Well, like twat no. waffle, <laughs> the the big list of refugees that killed Americans, and Beth started picking through. Well, that one's not a refugee, and that one's not a refugee, and that one happened somewhere else, and that one wasn't. You know, or there's there's a list of supposed trans people that. 
you know, yes. assaulted someone in a bathroom. And I'm like, well, that's not a trans person. That wasn't in a bathroom. That wasn't in a bathroom. And that was something else. And that was, you know, and, and the, just going through the whole thing and saying, well, that's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> Well, I, I know one of the things I, I struggle with, and it's the same thing about you with sharing that one about Scientology, is I have like four or five articles that, granted, it's coming from Todd Starnes and he lies anyways, but it's usually a church-state issue that he's usually left out the pertinent information that mm -hmm. would make it like his usual bullshit so I'm, I'm sitting there waiting to see you know trying to find you know the original case yada 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 and i'll go i'll wait three or four days and it's like okay well nothing else has come up in my new feed news feed about this and it's, it's so frustrating because like the other day i came across two or three memes we like the memes but I wasn't a hundred percent sure about the accuracy of the the information and I didn't have time to vet it for myself. And I am I try very, very, very hard not to share wrong information. You know, I don't like to share hyperbole. In some yeah. cases, I do if I'm trying to make a point. But it's like when you, you get these things, it's like, well, okay, it's a good meme. It's got a good point. Yet, but the information isn't correct. And it's very frustrating because, you know, this is not just coming from the right. It's also coming from the left, if, if I can yeah, use that. Yeah, and it's important. Economy. Yeah, and, and it's very hard. And it's just like sometimes I will share an article, and I'll use Occupy Democrat as an example. I will share one of their articles just because, I mean, I do headline hunt. And then I read the article and see if, you know, headline and article match. And if they don't, sometimes I will comment, hey, you know, the, the headline is like total hyperbole, but there's some good points in this article. Well, there was this one Occupy Democrat article that was just total junk, but it had one really good paragraph. <laughs> so he shared it. And it's just like it's it's really a tough call when you when you aggregate the news in that manner. It's like well, you know, I I have well now I'm up to over 700 different uh, news organizations or media organizations on my feed, not just Facebook. I have straight up you know message boards and yada yada yada. But I I just added like well, 130 newspapers from around the country. Uh, from various regions and it's like some of the stories you know you know I'm trying to weed out because you know, I don't know people in these areas so I don't know what's good or what's not so it's like you have to sit there and vet the stories before you it's it's very nerve-wracking and the, the more people that the more people that do you know that pay attention to that the better but the right well, I've even been like in in my Facebook debates, which are arguably sort of, you know, they're they're sort of just a hobby type thing. They're not. It's not like I'm, you know, filling up a hall like Dillahunty would or something. But you know, I, I there's people watching here and there. But like for instance, um, some some oh I know I was getting into it with this dweeb who was whining about people who swear which as you know drives me fucking crazy it's like you know where I want to have a discussion without any vulgarity I'm like what is your beef with like you know explaining how stupid it is and I always say well you know there's been a study that shows that people who swear have a bigger vocabulary and are you know likely smarter etc and a, you know well prove it and when you google that and I, I should just, you see, I'm not, I'm not as good as Beth at this yet because I never remember to keep the links. <laughs> but, but uh, um, you know, I knew it was out there, and I googled it, and there were news stories about the study. But I, at first, like now, at least, at very least, if that's the only source of something I have as a, as a story about it, I'm going to look for the most objective news outlet that i can find first of all 
But with this particular one, um, I wasn't really liking a lot of the top listed news articles, but I picked one and kind of read, skimmed it over. And luckily for me, that one had a link to the actual study. So to me, that's way better. So I gave them, you know, here's the actual study. And then they decided that, well, I don't want to talk about that anymore, of course. But yeah, yeah. and I think it's important because we have to like hold people who, you know, they agree with us in principle. But if we hold them accountable to saying truthful things, that will only make our arguments stronger. So yes. that way they can't point to us and say, oh, well, I know this one person, you know, they've, you know, shared this misleading thing before and, you know, maybe somebody called them out on it and they didn't retract it. So now that puts a shadow of doubt on everything else they say after that. And so I think that well, you being get, held accountable is better. Well, we get, you get that a lot. And I'm going to use Richard, Daw Richard Dawkins as an example. Like he sometimes on Twitter says some really boneheaded things in some people's opinion. And it's just like, just because he said that one thing shouldn't have does not make his research into biology bad. No, absolutely not, but just, I think it only helps. Like, yeah, and it is so hard because, like, one of the problems I run into because I deal with anti-vaxxers and pseudoscience um, is that, and, and Gleb did touch on it, you're not going to, I'm not going to reach these people, and that's why I said a lot of times in, in my discussions, I will think about the audience, people watching that are on the fence and hopefully something I say, you know, or any of us in the, in the pro science community, not just myself. And there's some really, really good people that, you know, are 10 times better at it than I am. And, and I use them as a guideline as how I want to approach things. It, it's, it's very frustrating. I mean, e even just in our face, Facebook debates, I mean, I jokingly say that, you know, people are like, well, why do you argue homosexuality isn't in the Bible and all that stuff? And it's like, because it's fun. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I know I'm not going to change their mind. But there uh, could not gonna be change. reading who, to them, it not being that in the Bible means the whole argument to them. So even yeah. though... And other people yeah. can come up with other shitty ways of, of justifying it. That one person might say, well, damn, you know, because I always felt guilty when I had to, to say those things about gay people, but I thought that's what God said. And now you're telling me God didn't say that. Well, hot damn. Now I can't, don't have to be a dick anymore, you know? And I, yeah, know I think some people are looking. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, part of the thing, one of the approaches I use is that people cherry pick the two Levitical verses and they ignore the whole context of not just the verses, but the chapter it's in, the book that it's in, and the history prior to that point. And I, I have found with the few people I have actually changed their mind is like, I didn't know about that. It's like, so I think how we approach, you know, how we discuss things, I think that's important. That's why I'm very ver verbose in my blog posts and they run 10,000 words or more. It's because yeah. I want to give it all and, and, and it's tiring, but I am a weirdo, so I find that kind of fun. No yeah, and I can take those and those would make my arguments better because if someone says something maybe not as crazy as something that like a hardcore anti-vaxxer says or maybe it's just like, oh, well, I have concerns, then I can take, you know, maybe some of the links that Beth has posted and, you know, um, not necessarily throw them, but say, well, here's how, you know, they've done the studies like Gleb was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Here's how they've done the experiments to show that vaccines yeah. don't cause autism and here's you know all this information on how they did that and that will only you know so I will I see these debates as something that helped me like maybe necessarily you don't change the other person's mind but people yeah. are watching because I love to see people being salty as hell online and yeah. so 
yeah, I'll sit there and like get on my popcorn and <laughs> all that jazz. But, um, well, but yeah, they help me. Example that yeah. you, you, you'll relate to, Morgan. Three people that I admire most within the legal field, besides Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, is Todd Stifel, is uh, Andrew Torres, and I knew I was going to blow a brain Sidel. gasket. There's a third. Yes, thank you, Todd. Uh, Andrew I Sidel. follow a lot. Yes, I follow a lot of what they write. I follow their opinions on court rulings. And, you know, I... You know, if they write a blog post or Facebook post, I will follow every single link. If they put 100 links in, I will read every single fucking link. I will read every court case of you. And what they do is they're presenting their their opinion on a case. And I think what it does is, it, it, you know, I was a lawyer wannabe years ago, and but I went into paralegal and decided I didn't like it because I liked the research and it was, yeah. But, I, it, you know, like you find it important for the, the anti-vax, I find it important for the law because it, it's rounded out my opinion on how I look at certain cases. It's just, I think that's important, mm. given that back, that context. Oh, well, speaking of uh, salty people, people being salty in debates, <laughs> I, was uh -oh. at I was at Pride yesterday. <laughs> And um, anybody who's on my Facebook will uh, have noticed that we had some fun being salty with some Christians yesterday. <laughs> but um, yeah, it. we had one group that were the really almost like Westboro Baptist type fuckwads. Oh. They they were the were best to have fun with, really. But well, as I said before, the. Um, the show like you know there were people we were kind of standing around taking verbal pot shots at them and but it was uh, they were standing right um they the street behind us was closed because virtually everything was closed in that area um but they were standing in the middle of what would have been a side street but because the street was closed they were just standing but there were people walking through constantly and they were mostly just standing holding signs that you know you're all gonna burn in hell and your abomination blah 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 and uh but people were walking by and one guy walked by he had his phone out was filming and was filming himself giving him the finger as he walked by <laughs> it was awesome but this um you know one woman walked by and uh i don't i think she just said made a, a verbal jab at them and uh he comes out with the one guy comes out with you have a nasty vagina and I'm just like, what kind of fucking stupid thing is that? And she says, well, my girlfriend has a fucking awesome vagina, so fuck you. And I just looked at him and I said, well, I'd rather have a nasty vagina than a dickhead, buddy. <laughs> at, at which point I was high-fived by another lesbian, so that was kind of kind of cool. But <laughs> Were there a lot of protesters there? No. I wouldn't say a lot like now we were in one specific area um, which was called young dundas square so which actually isn't the big the big square <laughs> oh, oh no. he's, he's obsessed with the microphone on beth's headset which is what that was <laughs> oh it's so cute oh my gosh You've, you've derailed my my thought process of bigoted assholes because there's a kitten. <laughs> I feel like there's been less and less, though, every year from what I see from pictures of pride parades, though. Like, less and less people showing up because I think they realize that all their bigot friends aren't there to agree with them anymore. Probably. I don't know. Like, like they're on the fringe year, now. Last year, um, it was so crowded because that was the big, big one. And... Um, where we where we met, like I met a bunch of people, and then we went to try and find a really good vantage point, which um, worked because I had an excellent vantage point. I got some really good footage of of the old prime minister there and and whatnot. But this this year, 
um, we, and I didn't even notice any protesters last year, but I think they go in specific areas where they think they're like, honestly, if you were to go down into the, the area where pride happens, it's, it's literally known as the village because that's just where lots of LGBT folks like to live. Yeah. And it's a great part of the city. It's quite lovely. Um, you know, and, and so if you were to go down like in the village with that shit, um, we're talking like a million either LGBT or LGBT friendly people in one place, like a million, literally. Um, I don't think that would be very smart. <laughs> <laughs> so we're these people were were kind of at the beginning area like it's a different square Nathan Phillips Square is where City Hall is Young Dundas Square is it's a ways from there and it's kind of like a mini square like it has it's it's like a mini Times Square it's got lots of you know L uh, LED billboards and shit like that but um, I think they chose to go there because there's a lot of traffic, but everybody's sort of going somewhere. There's not a million fucking LGBT friendly people in your face. Uh, at least yeah. that's what I thought. I really don't know. But the the really asshole group, there was only four of them. And they had, you've probably seen pictures, uh, if you've seen the one on my wall, they've got the um, the printed sort of vinyl signs, yes. all bright colors, and, and they're on like a, a frame that even has handles so they can like stand and hold them. <laughs> Oh yeah, and so there was only four of them, and they were the real assholey ones. Um, then uh, about a block away was another group, and this group, um, there was about 10 or 15 of them, and they all were wearing the same t-shirts, and the front, if you look, there's the picture I have of the one guy that we talked to, the fronts of the t-shirts don't say anything about them being Christians, it's on the back, but there was the leader, they had like a little... Um, booth set up and, with literature and there the leader had a megaphone and he was going on about I used to be a Muslim and then I found Jesus and uh, if Jesus loved you he <laughs> I love that if Jesus loves you he'll fix you and I'm like oh so when they can't not be gay anymore that just means Jesus doesn't love them anymore well fuck you buddy yeah but, the one guy uh, that reminds me so much of what I experienced in New Orleans. So um, my friends, like they hadn't really been in a long time. So they just wanted to go down Bourbon Street, which is like right. where a lot of the like bars and stuff are. Yep. And so they were going down there, but there is always, there's a church. I think they're called Raven Street Church or something. And they set up a giant cross in the middle of fucking Bourbon Street. Oh, and they yell at people with a <laughs> megaphone. And they yell, like, turn for away from your sin. And everybody's, like, got their, like, hurricanes and their hand grenade drinks in their hand and just walk around ignoring them. I actually took a selfie with my other atheist friend um, yeah. with, the, with the church in the background and, like, all the people, like, hanging around. But um, so there's another guy that hangs out there, and he wears, like, a white shirt and a red tie, and he has a beard, and his sign says... It's just like their signs that say, like, turn away and, you know, go back to Jesus. But his sign says, sinners welcome. And it has a picture of, like, a girl in a bikini and, like, hell flames behind it to promote his bar and club. Uh. <laughs> I love it. Oh, it's it, like he's right next to the church just trolling them, saying, sinners are welcome in my bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, this guy, this white, like, so this group. Like I said, there was like 10 or 15 of them. And so there was about five or six that were sort of clustered around the yeah. megaphone guy. And then the rest of them were sort of milling or because they were right out in front of a huge H&M store. And so the front of the store, there was like a very, very large area of si sidewalk. And so they were on the, the tip of the sidewalk because it was sort of a triangular um, corner. Mm -hmm. 
and then people were walking through milling around all around so the other guys were walking around handing out these lovely things can you guys see that uh-huh you need to uh scan that for me yes i will do that you know what that is don't you morgan wait i haven't seen one of those before that is a chick track uh, that's a real live chick track right there, baby. <laughs> Are you serious? I haven't seen chick tracked in like years. Oh yeah. And the funny part, because <laughs> they they were, but they were all handing out the same one, and it's called a love story, and it's basically, you know, Jesus. Oh, love that's disgusting. You. I know it's disgusting. To yeah. hand those out at like a pride parade and be like, "Oh, it's real love that I'm trying to show you. Exactly. You just know fake love. Like exactly. that's such fucking bullshit." That's exactly what they were trying to say. It pissed me the fuck off. Like here it says, "Who loves you enough that he would build you a gorgeous mansion in heaven to live in?" <laughs> My boyfriend, yeah. if he could have heaven, <laughs> he would build me a gorgeous mansion. Fucking right. I'm like, who wants you to tell him how very sorry you are for your sins and that you'll turn away from them? Like, oh, here's a beautiful mansion. Now tell me what a piece of shit you are. I right? know. Like, that's, oh, like, see, that, that's, that's love, funny. buddy. That's not how love works. For but 26 there, years, I prayed to not be gay. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Like, it worked like, really well. Hello, it didn't do jack shit. No. Follow the scientific method. The experiment fails. <laughs> so, so they were yeah. these, and some of them even had like little miniature New Testaments. And uh, yeah. my friend that that came that I met up with, um, Dalen, um, yeah. they were, they Dalen. Some, some women woman threw a well didn't throw but like like here have one of these a bible at poor Dalen, and they were like what the fuck am i gonna do with this piece of shit i'm like it looks a little small for toilet paper she's like well i don't know <laughs> maybe you could roll some weed in it or something That's what they said they said well it looks big enough for rolling <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah uh, but this guy kind of started talking to us so there was dalen and i and at the start um there was uh, my friend jamie and an, uh someone else that i just met for the first time that day dalen or dalen um alex so dalen alex jamie and i we had gone for brunch before we we saw the jesus freaks before but we went and had brunch and then came back and they were all still there so we're like yay we could still play and this guy from the Jesus Freak group, uh, by the name of Enoch, go figure. Um, <laughs> except, and and my friend, who was it? Dalen said that this guy looked exactly like Will Wheaton. And he kind of does. I, I will say, he definitely has that look about him. But his name is Enoch. And this guy talked to us for at least like an hour and a half if not longer it, it seemed a lot longer but i'm not sure <laughs> i didn't actually keep track of the time but, um and then at some point um oh and another friend of ours uh and and yes this is his real name is peace fire um no he wasn't given that he named himself that but that's oh, i was like interesting it, it it is his legal name. Um, yes, he has been banned on Facebook several times, but it is his legal name. But anyway, um, so Peace Fire came up, and I felt so bad. Because we've been talking to this Enoch guy for like, I don't know, a good 45 minutes or more by this point. So when Peace showed up, I was like, oh, hi, you know, hey, Peace Fire. And he'd not met Dalen before. So I was like, oh, Peace, Dalen, Dalen, Peace. I was like, oh, and this is Enoch, you know. Well, poor Peace Fire. He's like, he thought he was like another atheist friend of ours. And then he was like, started to pay attention to the conversation. I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> oh that's so, hilarious i felt kind of bad for him afterwards but this enoch guy oh man i i mean he was a nice enough kid you know um gave me all gave us all kinds of stupid ar arguments and like we How weren't even we? i figure 25 to 27 ish Jeez. um 
I don't know. You, you, his pictures on my wall, you can take a look later. Yeah, I saw some of them, yeah. But I wouldn't pay attention, really, to the, like, appearance of a dude. But I'll have to go back and look. Yeah, no worries. But um, we, we weren't even mostly debating the homosexual thing. We were... I was like, there's no God. You have to start with the God part before you get, yes. in, get into that. He's like, what do you mean? How can you say there's no God? Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, using the Bible as proof and all that bullshit and whatever. But at one point, a Muslim comes. And there were people. Eve, see, this is, goes back to who's listening. We're standing on a street corner in Toronto arguing with this guy. And at one point, some other person was videoing us with their phone and there were all there at various points there were people that would literally stop and lean over like oh what are they saying and like several times that happened so i was like hey we got an audience this is cool and so but at one point this guy came over and he wasn't he was just a normal street clothes so there wasn't anything to indicate it but i just had this feeling i'm like I think that guy's a Muslim. And next thing you know, because he and he started agreeing when we're telling him Enoch about why the Bible's stupid. Um, this guy was agreeing with us, but then he's like, see, and he pulls out like he has this like leather briefcase thing with him and he pulls out these photocopies and he's like see there's are the contradictions in the bible because the quran is true and i was like oh fuck <laughs> oh my god no i i put that picture up i was like look it's a christian and a muslim arguing over who has the best invisible friend Oh my gosh, that's I love it when like they do that. It's like, no, my uh, invisible friend is better than your invisible friend. It's like my dad can beat up your dad. You I know, guess. it's just like completely pointless. And then and then but the what I thought was kind of weird is Enoch seemed to be very threatened by this Muslim guy. And like the Muslim guy, I thought he was just being very passionate the way Enoch was very passionate and like Enoch was like if I said I don't even remember what I would have said but if I if I said something oh there's there's no archaeological evidence for the Bible he would turn around like now I thought we were having a reasonable discussion that's nothing reasonable you're not being and I'm like oh for fuck's sakes but when the, and and but the Muslim guy was sort of gesticulating a bit and Enoch got really he was like you know, don't point your finger at me again. And if you point your finger at me again, there's going to be a problem and stuff like that. What? And, That's yeah. Crazy. I know. And then, and then, and was he and like Middle Eastern? Yes. He was so maybe, Enoch, maybe Enoch's a racist fuck. Maybe that's why That's he's so quote unquote threatened. I think so. I, I think. And he was trying very hard to give us the idea that he was Mr. Nice Guy. And see, the only other people, Jamie is Asian, Peace is Asian, and Alex is white. Well, I think he's Eastern European, but, you know, Caucasian. And Dalen's white. I'm white. So, and Enoch, dude, was Asian. So I'm like, here's a brown guy, and he gets all uppity. And I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, okay, so he's Asian, so Asians are cool, but apparently brown people are not. And I was like, fuck, I wish so because we have we have some other brown friends that we hang out with a lot. One, one of them's name is Sudeep. He used to be a, a Hindu, but you yeah. know, he or there's some other ex-Muslim people we know. I'm like, shit, where's all our brown friends today? I want to test this theory. Where's all our brown friends? <laughs> But yeah, like that's what that sounds like to me. That he was just like scared because a brown guy started pointing. And the worst part was at one point because the I never I never caught the Muslim's name, but the Muslim guy was you know going on about why the Bible shit and Christianity is terrible and blah blah blah. And I'm I'm like agreeing, but then I'm like, give me a minute, I'm gonna tell you why you're crazy too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so but he, but Enoch, they said, oh, we got arguing about the part where it says in the Quran that you're supposed to kill all the unbelievers, and and of course, Muslim guy is like, well, that's only in battle and self defense and blah blah blah. 
And Enoch says, well, I guarantee you, if you come anywhere near my family, I'll kill you. <gasps> like, even if he's just not doing anything, like, even if you're like, come near well, me, I will kill when, you. When like, he, what the f When we called him on it, he tried to change it and say he meant in self-defense. And we're like, that's not, no, that's not what he said. He said, if you come near me, I will kill you. Yes. Like yes. that is a that's a threat. That's uh huh. Uh uh. Uh uh. Enoch's no good. Fuck you. No. Yeah, fuck I'm not you. listening, but fuck you. <laughs> I don't know. I ran, I ran out of business cards at Imaginary Religion, and I haven't printed any again yet. I need to because uh, otherwise I would have been like, listen to my show, fucker. <laughs> so I could tell you to go fuck yourself. <laughs> God, that's uh -huh. what a garbage person. Just in every way. Just a garbage person. I know. And I said to him, I said, um, you know, apparently this group shows up in that area fairly regularly, too, because the Muslim guys, I, I, I've, you know, uh, discussed or argued with you people before. And um, so I was like, you know, think about this from... Uh, a gay person's perspective. You're standing here in the fucking street corner. You know, let's say you're here every day and they have to walk by you every fucking day and hear that you're, you suck and you're, you're abomination and God doesn't like you the way you are and blah, blah, blah. Don't you think that's going to hurt somebody? And, and he, of course, avoided the question. Well, that's exactly because he, I told him I do YouTube and whatnot. And he was like, oh, that's what you do. I'm like, no, it fucking isn't because you have to deliberately come to me tell you you're an asshole. <laughs> Hi, Enoch. <laughs> yeah, but he's like going to these people's homes and he's going to this like LGBTQ neighborhood on purpose to yep. harass them. And that's just... That's completely yeah. different from having a fucking podcast. Like, go have a podcast and scream your garbage shit, and I'll yeah. call you out on it because you're, like, radicalizing people and just being a trash person. But still, yeah. like, that's completely different from, like, going up into my house and screaming your nonsense. Like, Exactly. Well, people have a choice whether to li listen to our podcast or not. Yes. When you're on a street corner or you're proselytizing going to somebody's house... People don't have a choice. Yes, they can walk across the street, but if you have a megaphone, most you likely a there's you still can hear them a block a fucking away. Yeah, I mean, th there is no no choice in the matter of whether you're going to listen to this fucked or not. Exactly. I mean, I I actually we used to have Jehovah Witnesses that proselytized when I lived in the house and. They would come on a Saturday morning at about 9.30. I worked at the time second shift. In other words, I didn't get home till 11.15, 11.30. In other words, I didn't go to bed till 5.36. Just falling asleep. It got so bad. They would, I told them, I said, you know, I'm in bed. You're waking me up. Mm-hmm. And they... they and they they kept doing it over. I finally actually had to take a restraining order out on, on the entire church that nobody from their church could come to my home. Wow! Jesus. Because they hell. would, yeah, they would not. I mean, but you have a choice. If if I go to their church and listen to their bullshit. That's my choice. Coming to my home or going to my neighborhood, you don't have that choice. I mean, walking, you know, as you said, he had a megaphone. You could hear him a block away. So what good is crossing the street going to do? And having people telling you time after time that you're an abomination, you're a sinner, oh, but God loves you, and yada, 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 that, that gets really draining. Oh, for yeah, sure. it does. Like people are like, yeah. oh, just ignore it. Well, you can't ignore it if they're like harassing you like that. I was remembering yeah. what Marissa said about that guy um, on her campus that she had to walk by that asshole day in, like every fucking day, mm -hmm. 
to go to class. There was no getting around it. And, and that's when she finally had enough and did her, her coming out video in the gun. Did you, I don't know if you guys went back and watched that. Yes. The best part was yes. at the end where she's like, how about a 10? I'm fucking transgender. And he goes transgender. And then the video cuts off. I was like, Oh my God, that's funny as shit. Yeah. Just, yeah but it, his voice. But anyway, yeah, like you can't. And, and Enoch was trying to say, because I said, you have to voluntarily go to my channel deliberately. And he's like, well, what if I just clicked on it by accident? That's that. I can't get away from that. I'm like, oh, fuck. Yes, you can. There's an exit button. And I know. It's just like people and that Why would you accidentally stumble on an atheist podcast? Like. It says atheist on air in the fucking title, people. Yeah. Like, it's, it, it's like. I got a, a DM the other day. I, I had changed my little byline thingy on Twitter, and I because I I was getting these really strange followers. Well, I thought that was kind of strange. Why would somebody who knows I'm an atheist and it's pretty much prominent on all all three of my profiles, if you include Google, that I'm an atheist mm -hmm. and I rag on religion? And basically, I do post religious post when it's like something stupid yes and someone goes well if you're an atheist why are you posting blah, 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 blah? and i'm like Ugh. so I, I i had a literally <laughs> I, yeah, I literally put on my twitter i i said i am an a for those of you that have no fucking clue i am an atheist and i'm an anti-theist get over it you know something along that yeah so i get this dm from some well, you don't have to be so rude about it. Oh. I've noticed. I'm like, well, you question my reality. This is why I post the three, three or four of my quote religious people that were following me no longer follow me. That's <laughs> so they, they weren't even fucking reading the article. Wow. They just. It's like seriously, just because I post something semi-religious. You know, it's just like earlier today, somebody that, that I regard who is a secular humanist, and I'm like, okay, you know, I've been following her for a while. And she posts a quote from Joyce Myers. Oh, boy. I'm like, I'm like seriously? Yeah. That's yeah, I, I don't know the rationale behind the quote, and I'm, I probably am taking you know, a con. It was a nice quote, and she liked it, but Serious, it's like people just don't think, but it's like you cannot accidentally go to a YouTube channel. No, no, I, well, you, you can, but not not as specific as ours is. No, and I'm, and like Morgan said, there's a fucking X button. Like you can leave after ten seconds if you want to, and never see us again. But if you're on a fucking street corner with a megaphone and right on somebody's way to work every fucking day, um, yeah, no, that's harmful. But anyway, Enoch was a dumbass. But uh, we, we had a great afternoon. And um, did you guys see I, I, I managed to round out my collection? <laughs> see that, Morgan? Show it up, oh, my dear. My God. Well, you're you're familiar with the pink variety. Yes, I saw that you got a whole set. I now have the blue and the yellow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and try to show them the fine yes. print. Okay, uh, hopefully it takes a little while for this to focus in. There we go. Can you read that, Morgan? This is intended for beverage use only. <laughs> I said to Deb, they probably had a, a pen bit. on there because, well, you know. Oh, it, well, because the problem is yeah. um, because this happens, I'm thinking, is why that's there. Oh, that's true, too, yeah. Yeah, and so for those of you who will be listening later, um, you if you're not new to the show, you probably heard about my lovely pink penis water bottle. And I think um, um, Steve and Ranger are probably cringing now that I pulled the tip off of this one. 
<laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Shut up, Lauren, Jack. <laughs> Um, but um yeah the 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 glands of the penis you pull it off to open the water bottle and put it in so i i got the pink one actually two years ago at pride and i wasn't able to find their booth last year and um so i didn't get them then but this year i found them and so i i got the other two varieties that were there so I want one of those so bad. I would take that to the gym. Well, you know what's really funny? Uh, if I'd have known that shit, I would have got you one. Damn it. Um, it I can really funny if I, it's like, oh. <laughs> I bought them and, you know, we were all having a good laugh that, you know, woo, I, I'm double fisting dicks here and, and whatnot. Um, and I turned around to go. And they didn't even give me a bag. So I've got like two plastic penises under my arm with my hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> and so I turn around to go, you know, with everybody. We're going to go to the next booth because this was the merchant's row. And this woman was standing behind me and she just gives me this big smile. She's like, can I have one? I was like, no. <laughs> well, I didn't go say that. I was, like, I was like, well, they're, they're, you know, two for fifteen dollars. Um, I I kind of just bought them. <laughs> like, I was I was trying not to be rude, but I was like in my head, I'm like, fuck no! <laughs> you just walk up to some stranger, like, can I have your plastic penis? Like, no. <laughs> oh my god. Yes. Uh, Steve says just the tip. <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed. So, yeah, that was uh, one of the highlights. I got to round out my penis water bottle collection. So, yay. <laughs> Anyways, we're coming up on the end of the show here. So, uh, best time to uh, let you guys plug your stuff before we get on out of here. So, Beth, where can we find you? Easiest way, Twitter, Dune998. That connects to Facebook and my blog, as well as, well, I have to manually add Google, and they're all doomed <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. Yes. So that's the easiest way. And I, I have been blogging again. I haven't done it in quite a while, but I did put out a three-part bit concerning the Health Care Act and, and the ramifications. I got into a discussion with a clueless person. <laughs> So. What is that I ever have, before? <laughs> well, she was like, well, I don't like the fact that illegals get free health care. And it's like, oh, lady, they don't. Yeah. I get that here, too. It's like, oh, you know, refugees get welfare. I'm like, no, it literally says they can't have welfare. <laughs> like, fuck off. Well, it's like I said to her, I said, if, if she goes, well, I know it's true because I know three people. And I said to her, well, did you report them? Yeah. <laughs> Good I point. said, if you know welfare, welfare fraud is occurring, and I'm not denying it does not happen, um, maybe you should report it. Fucking yeah, right. By not, oh, I said to her, by not reporting it and you know that it's going on, you can get in just as much trouble as they can. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Certain states, and she, that was the last last word I got in. She stopped <laughs> after that. I don't think she liked that idea. But yeah, you can find me there and Facebook, everything else under Beth Hay Hambridge. Awesome. Under all that fun stuff. And Ms. Morgan, where can we find you? You can find me on the Bi Skeptical podcast with Trav Mamone. Um, come, we come out with an episode about every two weeks, and you can find that on iTunes and Spreaker. And Stitcher, if anybody uses that. <laughs> and I then you can know. use Stitcher. Okay, I didn't know. Like, because I never know if anybody is using Stitcher. Good to know. So we'll keep it on there. But um, there. And then you can follow me at Mostring. That's at M O S T R I N G. And then you can find me on Facebook, Morgan L. Stringer. Awesome. Cool beans. And uh, let's see. 
Oh, sorry. Somebody's like messaging me. I was like, wait till the fucking show's over, would you? <laughs> so, of course, uh, we'll be here next week. Um, we don't have anything specific lined up yet, so we should probably get our asses in gear and do that. Um, but, yeah, we'll be here next week. Um, we are actually probably going to be changing the time of the show coming up soon. I've been thinking about doing it for a while because... Even at 9.30, our time, or my time, I'm sorry, Morgan, you're in one of those weird-ass fucking time zone things. <laughs> mm. Even if it's only an hour, it still fucks me up all the time. Um, but 9.30 can be kind of late for some guests, and we've had um, issues where some guests can't stay that long, or they can't do the show at all because it's too late or whatnot. So um, we're looking at, we haven't decided exactly um, what time, but we're going to discuss that and we will keep everybody posted on all the social media when, if and when that changes, but just giving everybody a heads up that we might uh, be doing that. If you're downloading it off a of Spreaker later, you won't fucking care because you do that at your own time anyway. So there's that. But if you want to watch us live, um, then yeah, we're, we're probably going to be changing and, and doing the show a bit earlier in the evening. So there's that. We're going to keep it on Mondays though, because um, that's when Beth doesn't have to work. So yeah, that kind of makes it a little easier. So um, you can also find me on Holy Crap, the vlogcast, which is Sunday mornings at 12.05 a.m. Run by the Shujin Tribble, of course. Um, there is no show. Well, there probably won't be a show this week. Um, I am going to be in Ottawa for the big Canada 150 party, um, watching some killer ass fireworks. Well, not on Monday night. We'll be on our way back or, or Sunday, Saturday night. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be in Ottawa Saturday night for holy crap. So, and, um, Shujin and Joey will be in, I want to say, is it? Pittsburgh or Philly, I forget which one, but it's uh, Anthrocon, um, the big furry convention. So neither of them are going to be available if Dallin decides that he's up for it because he's um, had some health issues lately. Um, he will do a show with whomever else he can scare up, but um, I, Shujin and Joey and I definitely won't be there. So chances are maybe 50-50 whether there'll be a show. But, you know, check out the channel if something pops up. Awesome. And Beth, I told them they could bug you to be on if we needed to. I know she's popped off for a minute, but um, <laughs> I'll tell her that when she comes back. Um, but, yeah, so holy crap, the vlogcast on Saturday mor Sunday mornings at 12.05 a.m. And, and I mentioned Steve and uh, the great debate community have actually been popping up over there on his channel. So that's um, Steve McRae and uh, the great debate community. So when he has open hangouts and I'm free, I pop in there and we talk about all kinds of, of bizarre things and it's debate. So there's actually quite a number of theists that pop in and out. Some of them are very reasonable and educated and make coherent arguments. Some of them are pretty fucking crazy, which is why I like it. So <laughs> Um, yeah, so you can uh, sometimes see me over there on the Great Debate Community on Steve McRae's channel. So, and of course, before we go, just want to mention the um, Whitefields Educational Foundation and the Taylor Scholarship, which we like to talk about whenever we can. And they provide counseling for people who are leaving or have left religion and feel like they want to talk to somebody about that. Um, the Taylor Scholarship was founded by David Michael of My Book of Mormon podcast. And... Um, yeah, that's a uh, fund for people who need counseling but are unable to afford it. They try to keep the fees as low as they can, but you know you gotta you gotta pay to keep the lights on and the internet rolling. So um, you know they need uh, they need to uh, charge a little bit at least. So if they can't afford it, the Taylor Scholarship provides that service for them. Um, you can donate there if you want to. So that's Whitefield's educational 
org forward slash my book of mormon podcast <laughs> and of course we also have a patreon and uh, we use that to pay for our speaker account right now so if you want to uh throw us some money at some point um we would greatly appreciate that as well so there's that oh bath i i don't know if you heard me but i said uh i told uh the holy crap crew that we're gonna be there that they can pick on you to be on the show if you want it if they want it to this week because shujin and joey and i will not be there so 50 50 if there's going to be a show you're still muted by the way there you go i'm still coughing <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah i probably won't be able to because this weekend is our weekend in the wild which means i'll be lucky if i get out of work by 12. okay <laughs> then. wow so, so um, I, all depends we the this time of year is our busy time so yeah well i just told them they could that that dallin could pester you if he needed to so it's all good it's all good and i say it's like probably 50 50 whether it'll even be a show so but anyway folks um thanks to uh steve and ranger for uh hanging out and making goofy comments in the uh, chat there and um yeah, he's like rum and co rum and coke night. <laughs> that's that's what we called the hangout the night we went and trolled flat earthers was rum and coke night. And I was like sober, which was I probably shouldn't have been, but I was. So <laughs> anyway, we will see everybody here next week. And until then, I will leave you with Dave Foda and his only creed for humankind. And um, yeah, happy Pride, people. It's almost over, but. It was a good one. I know the truth and power of reason and of rational thinking, and I will use them to my advantage. I know the truth and power of educating myself and of expanding my intellectual boundaries, and I will educate myself. I know the truth and power of vanquishing ignorance. And I will do so whenever the opportunity presents itself. I know the truth and power of morality without supervision and of true and accurate righteousness. I know the truth and power of obliterating tyranny, be it intellectual, emotional, or philosophical, and will work toward that goal whenever and however possible. I know the truth and power of human ingenuity. I know the truth and power of human compassion, and I will be mindful of the welfare of others. I know the truth and power of equality and fairness for all living things. I know the truth and power of the importance of our families, our friends, and our fellow men and women. I know the truth and power of human stewardship of our lands, our waters, and our skies and I will try to act to preserve our environment. I know the truth and power of the sciences of mathematics, of physics, and of chemistry, and of the important role of these disciplines in understanding the workings of this cosmos. I know the truth and power of the rejection of all notions or beliefs that reside in the supernatural or the superstitious and of those notions or beliefs that we are not supposed to be able to explain. And I know that these rejections are necessary for humankind's survival. I am a human being with a free mind, liberated from irrational influence and from unreasonable dogma.